Thank you all uh, for joining us today for EMCA's Unfinished Business, Post-War Greek Adoption History and Current Adoptee Activism Panel Discussion. My name is Lou Katzos, the president of EMCA, the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance, and I will be moderating this important discussion today. Our distinguished panel includes Professor Gonda Van Stein, the Korais Chair in the Center for Hellenic Studies and the Department of Classics at King's College, who will speak on the post-war adoption history, why an unfinished business. Professor Mary Cardaris, Chair of the Department of Communications as, at uh, California State University, East Bay, who will speak on the lifelong repercussions of being an adoptee, and lawyer Vasilis Sotiropoulos at the Supreme Court, Court of Secession, in the Hellenic Republic, who will speak on current action to restore Greek citizenship to Greek-born adoptees. The etymology of the word uh, orphan is Hellenic uh, from the word orphanos and is a child whose parent or parents have died, are unknown, or have permanently abandoned them. The causes for orphans are many. Wars, genocide, economic problems, cultural stigmas, social chaos, natural disasters, and plagues, and was used to describe originally those children who have lost their father before a puberty and with other definitions over time. It's an unfortunate uh, scenario and, um, and it's, a, it's a follow up really to EMCA's Hellenic orphans taken abroad from 1821 through the 1860s panel discussion that we had in, uh, in January. Uh, the topic of uh, Hellenic orphans and many really not so, brought over to America and other nations during the Cold War period in the 1950s and 1960s will be discussed more in depth in this particular session. This will include the history of post-war Hellenic adoptions, as well as the current activism activities around this very important area of concern, including the issue of restoring Hellenic citizenship to Hellenic adoptees. Among the many questions, are what became of the Greek adoptees in the 1950s and 1960s? How do they interpret their own adoption stories? What venues do they seek to make their voices heard? What remains to be done for them? What is the meaning of the Greek adoptee movement in the broader picture of Hellenic American and, trans and transnational relations? We hope, we hope this panel discussion and conversation contributes to the continuing wave of research, discussions, and results on this very important topic of post-war adoptees' unfinished business. Our first presenter uh, today will be uh, Professor Gonda Van Stein, as, as we indicated, the Korais uh, Chair in the Center of Hellenic Studies and the Department of Classics at King's College, London. She is the author of five books, uh, Venom in Verse, Liberating Hellenism from the Ottoman Empire in 2010, Theater of the Condemned Classical Tragedy on, on Prison uh, Islands, uh, published in 2011, and Stage of Emergency Theater and Public Performance under Greek Military Dictatorship of 1967 to 1974, published in 2015. Her latest book, Adoptions, Memory, and Cold War Greece, Kid Pro Quo, uh, published by the University of Michigan in uh, 2019, takes the reader to a new uncharted terrain of Greek adoption stories that became para paradigmatic of Cold War politics and history. This book is coming out in Greek in translation in November of this year, and Gonda will be obviously in, in Athens and Thessaloniki to present that book. Uh, she will uh, briefly outline the post-war but essential Cold War Greek adoption history and assess, and assess the numbers of Greek-born children sent to the U.S. and to the Netherlands. Her talk is entitled, The Post-War Adoption History, Why an Unfinished Business? And she will briefly outline the historical evolution of the Greek adoption movement. 
and loose ends that are left behind for more than 3,000 children affected. Gonda, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Lou, and thank you, Constantinos, for the technical assistance. It's my pleasure to participate in this panel, and especially with Lou and in the company of Mary and Vasilis Sotoropoulos. It's also great to be back, Lou. On a previous occasion, we had the opportunity to talk about Greek orphanhood from the time of the Greek Revolution through the 1820s, the disaster in Asia Minor, through the 1950s and 60s, and we came to the conclusion conclusion that it was actually the first time that loose panel and that any panel actually brought together a diachronic history of orphanhood in the modern Greek world. And on that opportunity, I had an, an, a, a first splendid occasion to, to, to give the history and to place it in that diachronic spectrum. Today, I want to go about it slightly differently, because after all, you can find loose recording of that previous session on the MK YouTube channel. So there is no need for me to go about it the same way. I will take a slightly different approach and I will try to rephrase the history according to some very common misgivings and to kind of separate out truths uh, from myths, realities from common stereotypes attached to this history. So if Constantinos would be so kind to bring up my slides. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to leave you with my contact information. It's very common for people to contact me. I encourage that. It's how I've gotten to know, actually, Mary, and how I've gotten to know many adoptees who bring me their questions. And if I get a serious question, you will get a serious answer. So don't hesitate. I don't live in an ivory tower. Our first slide, then. Yeah. So, very often when I talk to Greeks or Americans or colleagues, I am immediately presented with the following objection. It cannot possibly have been very many children that were adopted out to the US. It must be the exceptions that prove the rule. There must be very few. And even if they were adopted out, they must be orphans that famous and loaded word that Lou just introduced. And so if they are orphans, they're in need of a family. So what could possibly be the big deal? That's the myth. The reality is when we count the numbers of the Greek born children who were given out by Greece to the USA and to the Netherlands and even to Sweden and some other countries, we count a total count of some 4,000 people. That's a tremendous number, especially when you think of the fact that there are 4,000 forgotten people. This is not like the pedomazoma of the Civil War or the pedopolis, where people have discussed the history, reconstituted the numbers, argued about the numbers. Uh, this is a non-existing list of, in, in, for all practical purposes, almost non-existent cases, if it wasn't that these people exist and are speaking for themselves and that their travel records and their paperwork show that there are indeed very many of them, more coming out of the woodwork every day. And if you add them all up and include the most forgotten of all, which are the Dutch ones, 600 who went to the Netherlands, then we indeed reach that startling number of 4,000 children. So the quantitative aspect is immediately a reality that should be bunk the myth of there being very few. But there's also another aspect to that first misgiving. The fact that they're all orphans and therefore, you know, there, is, there shouldn't be any outcry about this adoption history, right? After all, orphans need a family. If a family also wants to take in an orphan, it's a win-win situation, right? Well, no. Orphan is a very fudgeable, a very stretchable category in the 1950s. I must say immediately after the Civil War, there were indeed many children who were orphaned. But either these children grow up in, in an extended family network in Greece, or 
by the by about 1955 we see that most of the children who travel to the us are no not orphans they have at least one known parent they are for the most part parent uh, children of unwed mothers so they are not technically orphans even though that label of orphanhood still sticks to them now these illegitimate mothers have given up children and and actually very many of them but mainly because society did not open up any other solutions for the young unwed mother who had typically been kicked out of her family, left unsupported, could not be employed, uh, had nowhere to live. In these circumstances, many young women gave up the child that was born to them out of wedlock. But technically, orphans, these children were certainly not. If the infrastructure or, or the taboos in Greece had by then been lifted, these children would not have been sent on the path of a foreign adoption under the label of orphans. Now, orphan is also some, somewhat of an, dare I say, insidious category. If you grow up in the US and you're told for your whole life that you're an orphan instead of an adopted person or an adoptee, then it, it instills in your mind the idea that you left nothing behind, not materially, but also not in terms of a family. An orphan, after all, in our common definition, is a child without a parent. And even is there, if there is an extended family, clearly they may not have cared enough to keep you. If that is the message constantly repeated to you by the use of the word orphan, you can kind of see how much damage that does in the long run, because it is discourages people from going back to look. People think that their birth parents have died and that the only path forward is not looking back, uh, throwing a black stone behind you, not looking back, only looking forward, building an American life only without thinking back of Greece. So that's kind of the psychological effect of the term orphan, which actually proved to be a misconception. And very many so-called orphans have indeed found their mother. A second myth, and I have about five in total, a second myth is that this, this Greek history addresses the need, these adoptions address the need of children immediately after the Civil War. So it would be a matter of only a few years, right? Only uh, that adoptions would only take place in some sort of a deep crisis for Greece. Adoptions that are an emergency response. That's a myth. The reality is, again, very different. These adoptions begin for all practical purposes. They really get going around 1950. Okay, that tells you that's close to the Civil War, that takes care of the orphans. That is indeed a very beginning stage with, with roots in the Civil War. But here's what people don't realize. They last through about 1975. That's 25 years of an unacknowledged Greek adoption history. I must immediately qualify by saying that the first, dare I say, 15 years are the most intense. From 1962 through 1975, it slows down rapidly, mainly because international adoptions have been then be subject to a few scandals and they get a very bad reputation, especially the ones to the US. So if we want to break that down a little bit, the first phase then in the early 1950s, that is the emergency response to the civil war. But from about 1953 through about 1962, we see what I've called the kid pro quo years of the Greek adoptions to the US, i.e. in other words, the gold rush. American adoptive parents of any stripe want children and Greece is willing to make children available, so these, these children cannot go to the U.S. quickly enough. The, the demand outstrips the supply. This is no longer taking care of children in emergency situations. This is no longer addressing a, a short-term crisis. This is actually creating somewhat of an industry where the demand rules the supply. And as in all economics, if the demand is really so high, you can be assured that the supply will certainly be met. So here is where a few illegalities creep in because the demand 
generates now the supply. And, and people feel that there is uh, you know, some money to be made by placing themselves strategically as mediators in this process. So we see children presented, for instance, as of unknown parents, even though there was a mother, and normally under normal circumstances, this mother should have been asked for her consent to the adoption. But because these adoptions of the gold rush years could not go fast enough, there are certainly a few shortcuts being taken, which we are now bringing to light. So, important to remember though, no, this is not a civil war phenomenon. It is a 25 year long unacknowledged history, which will lead us to the matter of the unfinished business. In a few more myths, if we can turn the slide. The myth again says, these adoptees go to Greek Americans, right? So what's the big deal, right? It is still the homogenia of Greek parents, the diaspora Greeks are as good as Greeks in, in Greece. It's almost like a slight extension. It's almost like a domestic adoption with a twist, right? These adoptees go to Greek Americans. So what's the big deal? They remain part of the Greek language, religion, and culture. That's a myth. The reality is, some adoptees go to Greek American couples, very many, and actually the majority do not. And for those who didn't go to Greek Americans, there was hardly any contact with the Greek culture, let alone the language, let alone the religion. And even those who did go to Greek Americans did not necessarily have an opportunity to keep up with the language. And the language is also always the sticky point, because keeping up with the language among the diaspora is hard enough, let alone trying to do that without any substantial con uh, context that is truly Greek or truly Greek American. So if these children don't go, uh, if many of these children do not go to Greek Americans, where do they go? They go to Americans of all backgrounds and religions. And religions plays a role because the Greek state, the Greek government is very much insisting, hoping, pushing that these children will go to Orthodox families. The reality is very different. These children go to Baptists, Presbyterians, Mormons, uh, atheists, and to very many Jewish families. That's a bit of a surprising component for which there is an explanation, which I can uh, elaborate on perhaps in the discussion session. But what do all these families have in common is they're typically white families. No children go to African-American families because African-American families in the 1950s did not stand a prayer of a chance to request a white child. It would have been inconceivable. In fact, they hardly ever entered the adoption market at all. So these go to white families and white families are in the 1950s seeking white children and Greek children are considered white enough. And I, and I add that enough because 15 years earlier that would have been questionable. So Greek children are considered white enough and therefore the demand. What these families also have in common, even if religion doesn't unite them or anything else uh, unites them, is that they're typically kind of middle class. Middle class to pretty well to do because it required a certain amount of money to do, to, to do these adoptions and the uh, Athens court, if it was the Athens court that processed the adoption, liked to see evidence of a certain financial stability in the household. Another myth. Greek birth mothers who gave up their children moved on with their lives and forgot whatever happened. Myth. Reality, the pain for Greek birth mothers of not knowing, of realizing they were put under pressure, of regretting that they didn't find their family, of still not having any closure is intense and it's painful to this day. And many of them have already passed away without ever having the answer of what happened to their children. When I meet them, and occasionally I meet them, uh, even though they're still shy and still ashamed very often of what happened before, you know, with the pregnancy before marriage in the 1950s, which was the worst that could possibly happen to a young village girl. When I finally meet them, the shame, even in their 90s, still rests on them. This makes of these birth mothers a group that we won't be hearing much of. 
they would only ever talk to me in the most private of circumstances. They will never start leading a movement like, for instance, in Ireland or in Scotland or, or even in Belgium and the Netherlands, is it's actually quite prevalent everywhere, of birth mothers who felt that they were unduly separated from their children. And that even they, though they consented, their consent was not necessarily informed consent because there was either undue pressure or they were just never given any other options or not properly informed of their options. I cannot hope for that kind of movement to be generated in Greece because the shame is still strong and many, pe many people are just not alive anymore. So they will not, um, well, they, they will not unite around that topic because they've never realized the power of their voices. Add to that that many of them were uh, you know, modestly educated, if educated at all, village girls, and they, they never think of them themselves as a formidable force in this picture, which I find particularly sad because I, I'm out to do something for them as well. And then the last and the greatest misgiving, the worst misgiving of all, these children went to the US they went to the land of milk and honey and they lived happily ever after and they never looked back. Oh my, oh my. The reality is even when they, had, they ended up in a loving family and everything went well, there is still that lifelong search for the truth, not necessarily for the birth mother, for, but for getting to the bottom of the story. What happened? Under which circumstances was I giving up? Why was I not wanted? Um, why did Greece consent to hundreds of adoptions without ever questioning where we all came from? And this is in the circumstances where adoptions kind of turned out decent. And then there are the very many adoptions that didn't turn out well. And these people speak of abuse, of trauma, of being unwanted, of being uh, given back by their families to the agencies who placed them, or of being kicked out of the house at an early age and ending up in an American institution after a few after they had already spent a few years of an um, of their early life in institution in Greece, so the trauma and the abuse are actually, um, and I decry it, rather prevalent. Uh, I wish I could say otherwise, uh, but it's not. It's not the case. Uh, the bad experiences are very many, and it takes people a while, and it takes them a deep level of trust, and very often they like to be amongst their own to be able to talk about it. Some of them also write about it, and the books that have been written speak about um, circumstances and speak sometimes very openly about abuse. But it took until 2011 for the people to really gather up the courage to start publishing their books. So that means 60 or 50 or 60 years of silence go by before people could finally say it. And that in itself, the, the not having a place to express what happened or to even to express your uncertainties about belonging or so, the not having an acknowledged space to be able to express that, that in itself was already very difficult. So that should put a few misgivings um, um, out, out of our mind, hopefully forever. More of this, more of the evidence that goes into it, more of my interviews with people can be found in my book, but there's, there's no need to repeat that. But it leads us to the big question of the unfinished business. Knowing what happened and knowing that some wrongs of the past cannot be corrected, we owe it to ourselves to ask what can still be corrected? And here are the three sticky points. Adoptees to this day suffer from a lack of records. Now, mind you, there aren't very many to begin with, and, and some agencies or mediators made the point of not keeping any. But there is a law, a Greek law, from 1996 that says that adoptees are entitled to their records, to any help possible to get to their records. Unfortunately, that is a toothless kind of law. And uh, the horror stories of meeting with 
unwilling bureaucrats getting the door closed, being asked for all sorts of impossible documents to prove who you are and to prove the name changes that took place in your life. Sometimes we meet, we see in that path of searching for the record so many hurdles that you actually really wonder whether that law of 1996 is put in practice or if it's just there to look good on the books. That's number one. Another part of the unfinished business is the lack of recognition. I mean, think of it. It's kind of sad that 60 years and for some almost 70 years went by for Greece to finally realize that they exist, that they speak for themselves, that they're not about to disappear and that their voices, the voices of these adoptees are actually growing louder. But the initiatives are taken by the adoptees themselves. Greece Greece still has an, open, an opening, but Greece has not stretched out the first hand. It's the adoptees who've done the hard work by publishing, by being interviewed, by writing, by speaking publicly. Uh, it's the adoptees who are owed recognition, and Greece is only ever so reluctantly coming along. So clearly, a lot more work has to be done here. And I would like to see work coming from the agencies who are actually mediators, agencies that are active and well, such as the AHEPA. The AHEPA, for instance, was involved in both adoptions with every good intentions, but also some adoptions that didn't go too well and eventually led to some scandal. But we all realize that what happened in the 50s stays in the 50s. What doesn't stay in the 50s is a possibility to correct some of these things. So this is an open invitation uh, to the AHEPA to not compound what happened in the past by indifference or lack of recognition. The door is open, adoptees are expecting it, and they would welcome any positive move from the AHEPA, especially in point number three, the fact that these adoptees lost their Greek citizenship and want it back because they were Greek citizenship. They traveled as Greek citizenship. They were processed in the courts as Greek citizens. So it's kind of unfortunate that in these days of uh, you know, uh, talk at all levels of re-engaging the diaspora, it's, it's somehow unfortunate that 4,000 active members of this diaspora um, should still really have to struggle to get that citizenship restored. But it's on that topic, the loss of citizenship, that Maria and Vasilis will speak. And I will round it off here with many thanks for your attention and, of course, welcoming your questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gonda. And uh, in the um, open discussion, we'll obviously go into some more detail about some things that, uh, that you have brought up, some important things that you have brought up. Our next presenter is Professor Mary Cardaris. Uh, she was adopted uh, from Greece to the United States in the 1950s. She holds a PhD in public and international affairs and is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Communications, where she teaches political communications, journalism and document, documentary films at California State University, East Bay. She is an Emmy award-winning documentary film producer who is currently working on a number of, of uh, short films about the effects of the environment on public health. She has written a novella, Ripped at the Root, uh, an adoption uh, story, which is to be published uh, later this year. As an adoptee, she has uh, also an anthology of Greek adoptee stories. Uh, this is a pioneering initiative given that no previous uh, uh, Greek collection uh, exists in English. Mary has, uh, has uh, brought on board 13 essayists for the collection, uh, which is entitled Voices of the Lost Children of Greece, Oral Histories of Post-War International Adoption, 1948 to 1968. Her stories, including her own, will strike home the experience of international adoption, whose impact is lifelong but is not properly measured, let alone acknowledged. Professor Kadaris will explain her own journey as an adoptee and what the embrace of her country, alas, Greece, means to her and others who hope that the citizenship will be restored. Her talk is entitled, The Lifelong Repercussions of Being an Adoptee. She will provide insight to the lifelong consequences 
of, of, of that and uh, how it impacted her life and indeed has characterized her life. She will explain how the same is true for all the Greek born adoptees who are, who are uh, writing essays for her upcoming uh, book. She will discuss the feelings of abandonment in particular, which can be eased in the form of welcoming Greek born adoptees back home to Greece, their nation of birth, and by restoring citizenship, stripped from them as children and infants, and also by making it easier to obtain birth and adoption records. Uh, welcome, Mary, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Lou, and uh, Honda and Vasily for being here. Um, it's a, a great pleasure and honor, and I'm privileged to have been invited to this discussion. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Athens, uh, where I was born and from where I was adopted in 1955. Um, I was born to an unwed teenage mother. Honda made reference to those um, women. Um, we think my birth mother was around 14 or 15 years old. Uh, the first 11 days of my life are, are a complete mystery. Uh, we do know that 11 days after my birth, I was placed in the Athens Municipal Foundling Home by my birth mother. She signed the papers, uh, and that is where my adoptive maternal grandparents found me. They are the ones who chose me. Um, they handled my adoption from the start. I, I went from, from that city orphanage to Pikpa, a public foster setting, uh, to a private foster home, which I believe was arranged by my, mater uh, by my maternal adoptive grandparents. Um, uh, and then I went to a cruise filled with Greek passengers, including me and my grandparents on our way to New York City to meet my new mother, and then on to Chicago, Illinois, and then Gary, Indiana, to meet my new father and, uh, and my new extended family. Um, as you can see, a lot happened in the first year of my life. Um, I'm grateful that I did not lose my culture of origin. Many Greek-born adoptees did. Uh, I was raised in a Greek home. I had large Greek families on both sides. Uh, I went to church, the center of our Greek cultural life. Uh, I went to Greek school. I had mostly Greek friends. Uh, as a young woman, I dated only Greek people, uh, no surprise, and, and not much of a choice there, I'm afraid. Um, I was active and involved in Goya, and we went to Greek dances. I, I also went to a Greek camp in the summertime. And yet, uh, and yet, my adoption and my difference as an adoptee have colored and characterized my life from the start. I, I have never not been the little girl from Greece. I have never not been identified as anything other than adopted. Uh, my whole life I was identified as special and that cuts both ways. I could never just be my parents' daughter. Um, I was always and will be always their adopted daughter. I could never just be my brother's sister I was always and will always be Nick's adopted sister. I am stigmatized that way and so is my brother uh, who is also adopted by the way, although not from Greece. Um, I wanna say before I, I get a little deeper into this um, that I am not angry at anyone. I do not look back on my life with any regret. I do not blame anybody. I, I, I'm just not built that way. Everyone involved in my adoption did the best they could under the circumstances at the time. And that includes the wonderful loving parents who raised me and the parents responsible for the very fact that I'm alive. Uh, my birth parents who chose um, or, or were persuaded or were forced to give me away. I have great sympathy and love. Uh, yes, absolutely love for my birth mother. Um, have I had a good life? Of course I have. Could I have had a good life here in Greece? Well, why not? Uh, we just don't know. And just because she was poor and young doesn't mean that I couldn't have been raised here in, in a loving home. Um, for the record, I'm 66 years old. 
although I probably don't look it, I'm sure. Um, I have no biological connection to anyone I know. And actually, as I get older, uh, that notion is, is terrifying to me in a way. I, I don't know who my ancestors are. I don't look like anyone or share any mannerisms with anyone I know. My family is from Lefkada and Ithaki. I know those places very well, and I love those places as if they are my own, but they are not where I am from. Uh, I share with my adoptive family um, those places. Uh, they uh, come from a long lineage, a bloodline dating back to the 1400s, but they are not mine. Um, all my life, I was told a beautiful little adoption story, um, but my past was erased. However, however young it was, however small it was, it was erased. It was erased. And as a matter of fact, a new birth certificate was even generated for me, as if my adoptive parents had been responsible for my birth. Um, my life actually began when I became someone else's child. I was reminded of my difference in big ways and small ways. And so as a result, I, I think I, I, I'll admit, I grew up as an insecure kid who always thought she would be left. Um, and my parents had to reinforce quite often, as a matter of fact, by pulling out adoption papers to, to explain that, I, that they weren't going anywhere, that I wasn't going anywhere. That was a refrain. As, as a young kid. Um, I could not sleep away from my parents and grandparents until I was a young teen. I never thought I was good enough to do anything great or good. Um, I often feel like an outsider. Um, and I have to say that these feelings often emerge and persist to this day. And for the longest time, I didn't understand any of them, my feelings. I always had to sort of navigate my place in the world without ever realizing I was doing it. Uh, these feelings found explanation just two years ago. Um, please know that without understanding where you come from and from whom you come, you can never be completely whole. This is the lesson and the learning that I am experiencing now. Um, after my last surviving parent died, it was my mother um, in 2018, I, I did feel abandoned and I felt untethered to anyone. Uh, but I also realized for the first time that I had the space and time to think about my past. I never wanted to hurt my parents and so I just kept quiet about any deeper questions I may have had. So I... I returned to Greek school as an adult, uh, as a senior, where uh, I met a woman whose cousin uh, has an unbelievable, incredible, sad adoption story. And I was moved by it and shocked by it. Um, I am a journalist by profession and I knew a great story when I saw one. Uh, I wrote her story. And as you mentioned, Lou, thank you. It's called Ripped at the Root, which has now been published and can be accessed from uh, Amazon and the publisher. Um, the subject, uh, the adoptee, uh, her name is Dina Poulias. There is no question that she was a stolen baby from Greece during the 1950s. And she had such courage in recounting the painful memories of her past and telling her story through me. And I'm honored that she was willing to do that. When researching that story, I met Honda um, and as a matter of fact, Dina appears on, I don't know, page 203 of Honda's amazing book, which I highly recommend. Um, and that's how I made connection uh, with Honda through my writing Dina's story. Um, and then I, I met another woman, um, Gabrielle Glazer, who wrote an incredible book about American adoptions entitled American Baby, which I also highly recommend. After Dina, then Honda, then Gabrielle, my own feelings began to emerge. After, after my search uh, was dormant for about 21 years, because I did poke around, but I stopped. Um, 
And then after I met these women, I, I was able to, to place my feelings in the context of my, of my own experience as an adopted person. So I'm evolving. Uh, my thoughts uh, and understanding are at this age uh, coming into clear focus. Um, the fact is, um, and, and Honda mentioned it, I, I was never an orphan. Um, and, I, and I was called an orphan my whole life. I had a mother and a father. I know their names now. Um, I know where my birth mother lives. Um, I have stood outside uh, her apartment uh, here in Athens, terrified to press that buzzer. Um, we don't know, and, I, and by the way, I just learned my birth father's name because some papers were recently revealed to me that I never had before. This very kind woman had a, you know, a dossier, a small dossier, which I, I just received about a month ago. It, uh, anyway, uh, we don't know what influence my birth father had on my birth mother or what place he held in her life. Or what were the circumstances of my birth? Did they love each other? Did they know each other? Um, I hate to say it, but he, did he rape her? Was I a product of a rape? Where were we, she and I, during the first 11 days of my life? I know I wasn't born in a hospital. We, we do know that. Um, was she forced to hand me over, persuaded, encouraged, or did she make that decision all on her own? And the biggest question of all, did she love me? Um, how did she feel um, when she physically had to hand over her baby to a stranger, which she had to do in a court of law with my maternal grandparents standing there? If you are not adopted, you know your birth story because your parents and family told it to you lovingly, probably many times over. Adoptees have none of that. And many of us will never learn about those stories, uh, the stories of our birth. And, and Honda, you mentioned that I mean, time is running out. People are dying and people are getting older. Whatever the case, um, I spent some time as nobody's baby. Um, we believe that my adoption was a legal adoption by proxy, but my adoption story told my, by my very well-meaning, loving maternal grandparents had holes in it. And I believe they wanted to make a better movie from the actual story of my life, from the reality that was my young life. This has been problematic and has left an emptiness, which I know is very hard for some people to understand. And I wanna say that this is completely separate from the life that I lead. It does not render my life meaningless or less than, but I wanna know the facts about all, all of my life. I deserve it. Um, and so do all the thousands of other Greek born adoptees. I am certainly not alone as Honda mentioned. In fact, I'm curating that anthology um, which will be published by Anthem Press uh, in March of 2022. Uh, with thank, Lou, Lou, thank you for mentioning it. And I'll, when it is published, I'll let, I'll let people know when it is. But 13 very courageous adoptees are telling their own stories and their stories are amazing, just amazing. Um, some are heartbreaking, some are fantastic, uh, some are joyous in the end. Others are painful and are about lives that have not yet been resolved. And we all know some will never be resolved, but there are recurring themes in each and all of them. Um, feelings of difference, feelings of separateness, feelings of abandonment, um, feelings of being incomplete, feelings of longing, um, feelings of fully wanting and needing to know our past. And there was abuse in some of these cases, which leaves a more profound trauma uh, for these people. Um, the long and short of it is that our lives were taken from us and we were placed in other lives to which we had no bi biological place or connection. Um, some of us who have biological children understand this in a more meaningful way. For many of us, our culture, our language and our religion were taken away. Uh, we were born Greek, we can prove it. But that was also stripped away. Our Greek passports, our citizenship, 
were rendered void after our one-way journey to our new lives, wherever that was. I believe this is wrong. Um, how can it be that the Greek government gives citizenship uh, to authors and actors, academics, philanthropists with absolutely no Greek connection other than their work in Greece, their, their fame and success? Um, how can it be that some Greeks find their way to citizenship through parents and grandparents, though they themselves were not born in Greece. So it's citizenship through familial association. Dina Pulius is born Greek. There is no dispute, there is no question. She should be the first among us to have her citizenship restored. Thousands of Greek born adoptees have mobilized and we have joined with many others, uh, thousands of others uh, of inner country adoptees. Uh, we need help. We need support, we need understanding, we need all of you who are watching this afternoon uh, to stand with us. What we are asking for is our adoption records unsealed and completely open to us and as complete as possible. Uh, we want our citizenship of origin restored if we want it back. And we are putting some pressure on the Greek government to have this happen as soon as possible. Um, recently, I was struck that the president of Greece finally granted citizenship to one Yanis Atetokumbo, the, the basketball phenom. It should have happened at birth for him. Uh, Yanis was born in Greece and identifies as Greek. Uh, as Greek. Uh, so are we born in Greece. So do we identify as Greek. And we are proud Greeks. We love Greece. And, and I have to ask, can we please be next? Um, it is indeed our birthright. Um, thank you for being here and, and thank you so much for listening. Mary, Mary, thank you for that. And we'll come back with uh, obviously some questions in the larger uh, in the larger panel discussion that we're gonna have. Just one small question for you. Are you currently a Greek citizen? I am currently a Greek citizen. And, and Lou, I wanna say that um, that came with um, a lot of humiliation to, to prove that I was a Greek, that I was born Greek. And, and the only reason I got it is because I had advocates in Greece pushing. Um, and this was a long time ago, but, but it's not about me because now I fight for everybody else to have the same. Um, and, for me, yeah, and for me- No, no, no please, no, please continue, please continue. It, for me, it means, it means everything. It's, it's the first, it's the first thing I know about myself. It's the only thing I know for sure. I'm a Greek and, and now I'm a Greek citizen. And I, when I'm here, I feel it. So thank you. Th thank you, thank you, Mary. Uh, our, uh, our next presenter, and, and then we'll go into the open panel discussion is Vasily Sotiropoulos. He was born in Athens. Uh, as a matter of fact, our, our, our panel actually is uh, international. We have uh, Gonda in London, we have Mary, obviously, in Athens, and we have uh, Vasily in Athens. Uh, he is a lawyer with the Supreme Court of Greece and holds a master's degree in public law. In 2005, he founded the first legal blog, eLawyer, in an attempt to generate a debate on the protection of personal data and respect for ci civil liberties on the internet. He is always looking for ideas for institutional innovations that bring people closer to their constitutional freedoms. With that in mind, he was first elect, he was the first elected ombudsman of the city of Athens in 2012. Alongside of, uh, of a group of coworkers, they create this structure or created the structure from scratch in Athens for the prompt resolution of disputes between the citizens and the city of Athens. Having uh, been elected ombudsman for the region of, of uh, Attica, his mission has been to strengthen the relations between citizens and public services and to achieve the resolution of disputes between them, acting as a mediator without having to go to court. Vasily, Vasily's talk today is entitled Current Action to Restore Greek Citizenship to Greek-Born Adoptees. Uh, Vasily will speak about the efforts made to have the uh, Greek citizenship of Greek-Born Adoptees recognized he will explain how the current activism builds on other challenges that have been posed in, in narrow definitions of Greek citizenship. Well, welcome, Vasily, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. 
this is an honor. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very new in this discussion. Uh, the professors are very experienced and uh, they described uh, uh, from a personal point of view, Professor Kadaras and from a more historical point of view, uh, Professor Varstin, what's happening. So my role is to contribute uh, as a lawyer, what can be happened uh, with uh, the three uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, finishing this business, like uh, the access to the records, the recognition of the whole situation, and of course, the restoration of the citizenship. Uh, this is a challenge, of course, for every lawyer to, to find out how it will, it will be working because there are many different cases. There is not, uh, there is, there's not just, um, uh, it, it's not just easy to find all the documentation that it will be needed for the Greek state uh, to recognize retrospectively the citizenship. I'm sure that uh, uh, Professor Kardaras experienced uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems and uh, um, barriers in, uh, in, in this way. So first of all, uh, the, the idea uh, is to uh, document the, um, the, whole, the whole logistical structure of how this happened. And uh, at this stage, the book of uh, Professor Gonsden and uh, other books are very, very valuable because we have to present to the, uh, to the competent authorities that there was a structure uh, of uh, uh, this kind of adaptions during uh, the relevant uh, decades, uh, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Uh, our work, secondly, is to find uh, cases that click that have a connection with this whole structure and to place them uh, within uh, the sphere of the general situation and the general um, mechanism uh, that uh, all this happened. This is very difficult because the, the Greek authorities will always be reluctant when it comes to personal data and very much to the citizenship restoration. But we have some new tools, like the 1996 law that Professor Van Stem referred to uh, before, that um, the, the, the child has the right to know the documentation of the adoption. But this is not all. We also have the new right uh, of the data subject to access to his documents. Uh, I have been told by many people that um, there were many, many barriers to enter the archives, the official archives, the registries, the official archives of the state. Um, the public officials are not always uh, very, you know, um, uh, they, they do not agree that you have the right to find out what, what happened so many decades before, because you don't have um, a, a very good proof that uh, this is a case that uh, there is a link with you. You are not the data subject for them. If we uh, prove that you are the data subject and we need so much all this documentation, then you are entitled to access to the official uh, archives. So this is article 15 of the general regulation for personal data which is a new regulation uh, adopted by the uh, European Union, the GDPR. Uh, and uh, uh, it is always, uh, you know, this is always um, what they say when they don't want you to, to have access, that there is a GDPR uh, barrier. No, this is not a, a barrier always. It is also a tool to have access. And uh, it does not provide uh, always for prohibition, but also uh, for access when you can, of course, approve that you are uh, prove that uh, you are entitled to as 
the data subject. So the citizenship. The citizenship is a very uh, hard question because it has to do with restoration. There is no, uh, the request is not that uh, like Yana de Tocumbo, we want to, uh, to get a new citizenship. No, we want retrospectively to recognize that we were citizens of Greece uh, from the very first day, from our birthday. So um, it has to do with recognition. There are no uh, very structured rules uh, in the Greek legislation for the retrospective recognition. You, you have to, you have always to to be very innovative, and um, you you have to to, to find out uh, how the provisions of the Greek legislation will lead to this uh, result. This is not a very um, simple case. Uh, the officials from the Ministry of uh, Interiors are always very, very reluctant. Um, they are, uh, uh, of course, uh, interested in what what do you have to, to tell us, but um, I can see and I feel that the, in the end of the day, they will always be very, very, um, you know, sometimes even negative, even, uh, even so. Um, so I, I don't want, uh, I don't know if the, the, the whole scheme will be successful through the traditional administrative uh, ways. But all this um, cause, I think that will lead at the second level to um, to find out that there are some gaps in the Greek legislation. We have an example, a historic example from the past, when the Greek state faced uh, the situation of the people that were uh, expatriated during the, the civil war. We have the legislation of 1982. What happened then? The Greek legislator decided that we must have these people back by legislation, by a specific piece of legislation. I think that um, also this case of uh, or that we are discussing um, may, uh, have, may have a better uh, chance if we present them, present the legislators, present the politicians that they have a historical uh, business to finish, like uh, like our title is um, that there is there is uh, interest from many many people that you cannot go case by case. Okay, you, you can go case by case, but it is certain that you will find barriers, and uh, in many cases you, you will find a wall. Um, this is very important. Uh, for the parliament, for the political parties to understand that here we have a question mark, uh, a, a historical injustice, if you want, that the Greek state has caused harm. We have, we have to demonstrate that there is state liability in all this uh, situation, in all this discussion. It was not just the, the individuals, the lawyers, the doctors, the people, the poor people, the, I don't know, the, the, the parents, etc. It was the Greek state. The palace had, had also its role. If you've, if you've read the, the, the book of Professor Van Stem, uh, not only the palace, public officials, public registries, mayors, priests, all these people are uh, public officials. So there is state liability. And we have to, we have to present to the, to, to the political world in Greece that this is 
state liability that if we go to the courts at a later stage, it may cost uh, compenses, uh, I mean, money to the state. Um, so the best way is to find, to find out a regulatory solution, uh, a legislative solution uh, in order to, to face, to handle the whole situation as a pattern and to provide for specific rights with time limits, perhaps, that you must do the, the whole situation in three years, for example, if you have all the, all, all the documentation. Uh, with, uh, with a specific administration uh, procedure, with a fee, with a state fee perhaps. Okay, we, we can discuss all the things that the Greek state will be, um, will need in order to, to recognize the whole uh, class of all these people that uh, are demanding their citizenship, their dignity, their roots. So, uh, there are many things to do. Um, we will try to start with three completely different cases, but under the, the, the same umbrella of this whole situation. And uh, we will go uh, case by case in order to find out how it will work um, in the level of a bigger picture, of the big picture, how the legislator uh, can um, intervene and, and give a democratic uh, and uh, legislative solution in the end of the day at the Hellenic Parliament. This is my point of view. This is, uh, there are many, many philosophical, uh, legal, constitutional uh, questions that uh, we can uh, discuss. But uh, in its core, this whole case, this whole, this whole adventure, I would call it, uh, it is of a Greek nature. I, I don't know, I don't want to be personal because I have nothing to do with the, I'm not an, ad an adopted uh, child, I think, uh, but, but because you never know <laughs> what happened. But um, I think that this is very, very Greek. It goes me back when we were studying the Greek tragedy. And uh, I think that, uh, if this is a Greek case, we the Greeks can give the best solution. We can find out. Uh, we, we can use our traditional uh, historic experience of how you handle these things with dignity, with rights, with recognition. So I hope um, it, it was illuminating that uh, a certain level with the lawyers must not uh, speak very much we we must keep we must reserve our powers for the courts for the for the public authorities that we will defend people but i think that uh, i gave you a sketch of uh, how i can imagine that the things may work in greece so well, thank you very much again. Vasily, thank you thank you so much for that because the the bigger picture uh, to a certain degree has has in my opinion has, this was fascinating, by the way, but the bigger picture has uh, more validity for uh, success, I think, than the individual, uh, you know, fighting of, of each person to get their own records and all, and all the rest of it. There's no doubt, there's no doubt that this is a, this is a Greek state uh, um, serious, serious problem and, uh, and liability, quite frankly. We all know, even those who are not adoptees, that getting your Greek citizenship is a serious issue. Whether you were born in Greece or whatever, many people were born in Greece and it's taken them actually years to go through the system, even though all the records exist, to become Greek citizens. The diaspora in general, many people are angry about this, by the way, and I hear it all the time. I did an event that having to do with, uh, you know, how do you get uh, you know, your Greek citizenship and becoming a dual citizen? Uh, also based on the fact that the 200th anniversary of the Greek revolution was, co was coming up. So, so I'm listening to all this and I'm listening to all the individual trials that people are having. And they do not want, not only the adoptees, they do not want many people from the diaspora to get their citizenship, period. And I think, and I think your, your concept 
And people can argue this. They can say whatever they want. You know, government officials can do whatever they want. And we'll have a conversation earlier of why we're having this event when I met uh, Gonda in Athens, uh, you know, in, in, in late July. But getting back to what you were talking about in terms of, of uh, legislation, creating legislation that will make it easier and a path for people who are acknowledged as being an adoptees as a created, a Greek state created circumstance with the appropriate liabilities and all the rest of that to allow those individuals uh, to, to become uh, Greek citizens or to at least give the pathway to become Greek citizens a lot, a lot quicker. Would, would you like, and, and the other, uh, the other uh, panelists to, uh, you know, to, to uh, go into that particular issue? Well, I have a question for Vasily. Um, I don't, I don't understand why um, the government, why the state doesn't view this issue for adoptees and others. And I, I agree with you, Lou, people who were born here have a hell of a time getting their citizenship in, in Greece. It, it's impossible, but doesn't the Greek state see this as in its best interest? It, it, you know, I mean, it even expands the voter base here in Greece. And no, they, they, they don't, Mary, Mary, they, they don't. And this is an open discussion now. We can chat with each other. No, they don't. As a matter of fact, because they're so politicized, they, they fear. They fear other people becoming Greek citizens and having the ability to vote. It's absolutely ridiculous, okay, that, that Greek governments, regardless of which government it is, has the same problem. I was born in Greece, came into the US, I have all the papers. It took me seven years, seven years to get, to get my Greek citizenship. I, I know a lot of people, I could have gotten it very quickly, but I prefer to go through the system, okay? And so many people may say, hey, Lou, it's a mistake. You know all these people, why, why didn't you do it quickly? Because you know what? I got so angry, so angry and ticked off as to what was going on and that they did not want to process that paperwork that I just sat back and relaxed. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm gonna go through this thing step by step, screw them, excuse my French, screw them. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to do that. So when we hear about the adoptees who have, who, have, who have all these issues about getting the information that they should be getting anyway, and then after they go through the process of years of trying to get this information, and then they put them through the process to do the same type of thing that totally infuriated me not only me, but, but thousands of people throughout the world, by the way, the adoptees must be, must be seething, seething in anger about this. Yeah. I clearly share this point of view. Um, it is a reality. First of all, they are afraid of what's happening with the, with the ballots, <laughs> if you get the writing quote. They mm -hmm. cannot measure it. They, they don't know what happens. So, secondly, there, is also, there are also layers in the Greek administration. It, it, this is not a matter just for the ministry, for the minister. This is the whole bureaucracy, which is a very hard bureaucracy um, when it comes to the recognition of the citizenship. Uh, they, they are, they're really very, very strict. They are removing happily citizenships when something's not very clear. And this is a case that uh, um, I have uh, find, found out uh, many times. And uh, they are not corresponding with what the minister says. Uh, I mean, I had a case when the minister said, okay, give them the citizenship and the, the public officials do whatever they could in order to avoid uh, the, the man to have the, the, the Greek citizenship. They issued the, the decision from the, from the minister and uh, backwards, they, I mean, in, uh, you know, uh, later they, they tried everything in order this to fail and not to be um, in, in force. This, this, this is completely Machiavellic and this is very, and you are in the core of the deep state here because there is the deep state in uh, Greece. And when it comes to um, patriotic issues li like the citizenship, they're they are very, very uh, reluctant and they don't know what happens uh, if uh, you open the gate. So, but they, but they, certainly, they certainly have no problems going overseas and talking to all the people of the diaspora, 
telling them how they can how they can support the Hellenic state within their own nations and all the rest of that, how they appreciate them, how they love them, how they do all these type of things. And, and meanwhile, meanwhile, the reality is they don't care, okay? And they don't want them to become, uh, you know, Hellenic citizens. I'm going to get away from, from the general aspect of Hellenic citizenship and going back to the adoptees, because that's really the core issue that we're, we're talking about today. And and Agonda, uh, you know, outlined three different different problems that that we have. One of them is lack of records that we talked about, lack of recognition, and and obviously the loss of uh, of Greek citizenship. Can we talk about the issue of lack of records? What what is actually happening? Why is there a, this lack of records? Anyone? Well, it takes the other piece quite a while to realize what it is they have. And then the next step, well, most people start with the presumption that there are no papers or have been told that the papers have disappeared and that there's very little to be had. So it is quite a learning process to then find out how there are records to be had, both to the Freedom of Information Act in the US, you can access your your immigration file. If, if everything was done by the book, then there is an immigration file. But there are also records still to be to be retrieved from the institution where the child may have spent some time. So as soon as we can define which institution that was, you can actually start to approach those institutions. But all of that requires really penetrating whatever little detail there is about your adoption. And I can um, use Mary's case as an, as an illustration, for instance. Mary was told during her whole life she was from one institution. She was actually even on, taken on a trip by her grandparents to go and see the institution turns out she's from a different institution so so penetrating the very details can me can make or break what you can know about your adoption but it takes a little bit of a learning curve and 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 people need a little bit of help and then you know one hopes that institutions are willing to collaborate. Some are, some are not. Uh, there is also an effort being made by the, 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 the Bureau for Adoptions in the Ministry of uh, Labor and Social Affairs, but it is still in the coordinating stage. So it, the, the, the pity of it all is that the law from 1996 is of 25 years old and doesn't really seem to have changed the landscape of how uh, these adoptees can access their information because there is no sense centralized initiative to meet them halfway. There is no list, even though it would be possible to put all these, to make a record of 4,000 people can't be that hard. Um, to, to kind of say, okay, whenever this person with this name knocks on the door, even if they have only 50% of what they, uh, what they can at that moment produce in terms of documentation, we should meet the them all the way, rather than abusing the lack of the 50% that they don't have to say, you have to come up with more documentation, you have to have a lawyer to, to, to confirm your name changes, you have to employ your lawyer in Greece to do this for you, and, and kind of put more obstacles in the in the path of people. I get the feeling that, that uh, more goodwill needs to be in place to meet these people at least halfway. Well, let me, let me let me ask you a question. It's, is it is it a lack of records or a lack of access to records? I mean, it seems to me that the records exist, but the access getting to them seems to be that seems to be the problem. And, and when you mention lawyers and all the rest of that and research and all that, it almost seems to me like like that, like that's another business, quite frankly, just like the business of, of, of the uh, of the children to begin with in, in the 1950s and 1960s. The, the bottom line is it's a gatekeeping issue that there will always be a person uh, who who thinks that uh, perhaps through the through the new privacy laws perhaps uh, uh, you know people can still not access their records even though the law says law law then clear that as an adoptee you're entitled to, to your records but some some gatekeepers will invoke for instance the privacy of the birth mother uh, in claiming that she also has a right to her privacy but that's not what the law says. So it's, a, it, it's really uh, deep down a matter of uh, fear of taking responsibility and gatekeeping. We, we talked know, about, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Vasily, please. The problem of uh, lack of documentation was the third case that we will. Uh, yeah, uh, it does uh, exist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where uh, uh, the, um, 
the adaptee has only one element, only one document, which is a very small picture of a baby, uh, of, of a nurse uh, holding a baby in front of, uh, the, of, the, of the hospital. And this is the, the only element, the only data. So you have to track uh, when was perhaps this picture taken, um, who was the nurse, uh, the clothes, uh, does it fit with the date that the, uh, the, the child was, uh, had been adopted, etc. And then uh, you, you can, uh, you can um, demand access to the records and to try to, to click it with, uh, the, with the, the big picture. Yes, Vasily, but if we go back to what you were talking about, creating the legislation and hopefully having, having the politicians create a law, they can actually put together that information and that data for every adoptee that, that the 4,000 that Gonda, Gonda is talking about, rather than making it impossible or making you know, people you know, becoming like Sherlock Holmes to try to figure out who they are, what clothes did they wear, and, and all the rest of that. It's, it's absolutely outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous that that uh, those children who are who 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 should be made automatically, uh, you know, Hellenic citizens being born in Greece and through the laws that were established at the founding of the nation, that they have to go through this process. It's absolutely ridiculous, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, if uh, I may, Vasily, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Honda. Vasily, what about you know? Many of us have our our baby passports. I have my baby passport, our blue passport. Mm -hmm. Why can't those be used as, you know, they're expired passports? Why not, you know, my name's on it. My, why can't those just be re restored, renewed? Exactly. This is the, this, this is the, the most, um, you know, obvious uh, element that uh, can be used in a situation like that. And I, I think that this will be the core of a new legislation um, uh -huh. in this uh, aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Getting, get, want, getting, I'm sorry, Gonda, go ahead, please. I, I wanted to add something different on the level of, 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 of the bigger picture of ethics. The adoptees are made to feel as if they have somehow commit, committed a crime and need to prove their innocence, as if that somehow their request for restoration is somehow a suspicious activity and therefore every little piece uh, needs to be found and needs to be documented to kind of rise above it and be proven innocent, which is a total misconception of where the fault lies. The fault has never uh, lain with the other piece. The fault lies with the Greek state the, the, and, and the mediators, of course, many of which have disappeared. But to, to actually put the victim in the role of having to prove their innocence is a complete distortion of how this case of restorative justice is misconstrued. The burden of proof should not lay on the victim. The burden of proof should go back to the people who actually committed the actual deed. Uh, and so yeah, the fact yeah, you know, they're almost forced to be like enemies of the state. They're sitting there in front of in front of judges, you know, like enemies of the state. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's 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 anyway, Gond, I'm sorry I cut you off. No, no, it, but it's a misconstrued conception of where victimhood and where the burden of proof proof lies. And right now the, the collecting, the agonizing, the, the working through the bureaucracy, all of that rests on the sh shoulder of the adoptees, which is as I said, it, it's 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 an it's a reverse picture of what it should be. And, and and let's not forget, this is for some people 70 years overdue. So yes, the voices are growing louder, but they are growing louder and, and, and they're actually more frustrated because you know, all we have seen seven decades of missed opportunity of a hand stretched out to these people to to to, to correct something, to to draw them in, to reconcile, to 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 at least or to at least do a proper investigation so we can go to the bottom of it. Did it really take a total outsider, myself, to lay this bare? It, it, my first answer would be no. Vasily, Vasily, you were going to say something. I was going to say that um, all these guys from the government institutions, they will say that this is a matter of sovereign. Um, the state, this is not a matter of uh, human rights, for example. It has to do with the link uh, of the citizens with, with, the, with the state. 
it, it, it has nothing to do with your origin, your private life, your family life, etc. When it comes to, I mean, when it comes to the recognition of the citizenship, and uh, so for them, it, it is not a matter of burden of proof. You have to to, to find out what happened and to yeah. provide all the. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was a child. I was abducted, and I have to provide all the information. I mean, that's 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 patently ridiculous when we think about it. If I say, I agree with you that we're we're dealing with. I'm not going to say, you know, wise guys hiding behind the law, but this is absolute nonsense. And and I, I and I do think your path. Uh, you know, I think if anything came out of this discussion, your path of legislation. Mm -hmm. And it goes into the second thing, which is the lack of recognition. In other words, Wanda, that was one of your points, the lack of recognition. Yeah. Let's go into that, the lack of recognition and how we can raise up the recognition. So, in fact, this could be legislated and, and we don't have to deal with this, that every person who's an adoptee who has to go through this day after day after day, after all these decades, it's, it's, it's torture for them and it's not yeah. right. Can we and talk about the lack of recognition? Yeah, and to add to your words, Lou, it comes on the on 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 top of all the other burdens that are already psychological you know, baggage that come with the adoption. Uh, to go back to Vasilis's point, for for a state to cast this uh, to cast adoption as a private matter, uh, as only exclusively, is is wrong too. When an entire government uh, on both ends, the U.S. and Greece, collaborates in in uh, uh, issuing the right leg. Legislation, issuing the visas, uh, keeping each other abreast of, of, you know, whether there are visas available, whether more can be, be available. This is a public policy issue already in the 1950s. It would then again be misconstrued to reduce it to the much smaller confines of a private matter. So that brings us to the issue of recognition. Um, Instead of continuing to perceive this as a matter of shame for a country, you could call this, you know, the big skeleton in the closet, right? Not only of the family, but of the country. A, a country is enriched by embracing every aspect of their history, grows wiser by understanding deeply, profoundly, a history that really pervaded so many families and so many societal structures. So if a country can come out enriched, why not embrace investigation and recognition? It's how happening actually, if Greece wants to be in the lead at this moment and make a breakthrough, they would be joining Ireland, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Switzerland, Sweden, uh, Chile, Spain, uh, the UK, that are all right now in a very heated adoption debate where the focus is on the victims and the victims being the birth, the birth family, the birth mothers typically, and the children. So they would not in any way kind of and Greece has nothing to lose. Greece would join in the forefront of what is a very prominent uh, Western European um, uh, discussion right now and could actually show leadership in that area rather than being, you know, kind of lagging behind. So my invitation would be, would come with the words of Oedipus, which is the oldest mythical adoptee, right? And like Vasilis is going back to Greek tragedy, there's that moment, that brilliant moment in Sophocles' Oedipus the King, where Oedipus is kind of closing in on the truth that he may have killed his father and he may have married his mother. And, and at some point he says, I don't think I want to hear what you have to say. And the messenger says, and yet I will have to say what I have to say. And I think this is the issue of the adoptees as well. We've come to that moment where Greece may have some inkling of what has happened, but we have reached the moment where it has to be said. And let it be said in the best possible circumstances or, you know, what happened to Oedipus, you, you know, we ripped our eyes out. So, so let there just be a message from Greek tragedy and let this be an opportunity for leadership rather than for a defensive stand and an and, and act in which we would be lagging behind. I say that because I come to this with a great sense of caring for the adoptees, but also deeply caring for Greece, because because that's what I've always done. Uh, but but that also means kind of, you know, laying bare what needs to be corrected, because I care so much. Listen, if, if, if Greece lost its children, Greece should want its children back, quite exactly. frankly. Uh, Costa, can you bring up uh, uh, Gwanda's book, if you can, the, you know, the image, uh, if you can, yeah. 
So, so uh, uh, this is obviously Gwanda's book. I, I, I strongly recommend that uh, people pick it up to, to learn a lot of the background of it. Gwanda, could, could you just discuss with us that one, uh, when, I, when I did the image for this particular event, I had one of your, uh, one of your charts actually that discussed mm. the, uh, the uh, adoptees and relationship to its population. Can you, can you just go into that a little bit so the audience can understand how severe this was on a percentage basis relating to the population? Yes. Between 1948 and 1962, statistics were drawn up by uh, the visa offices of the U.S. So the numbers are centralized by the U.S. as these orphans from various countries are coming in, from Greece, from Italy, from Japan, from Korea, and, um, and a few other countries, uh, Germany and Austria and Ireland. So those are the first. In that constellation of uh, adopt adoptees coming in from 1940, 48 onwards, when the laws are still being rolled out, we immediately think that the first ones in the lead of inter-country adoption are you know, children arriving in the U.S., that those are going to be the Korean adoptees because of the Korean War and the GI babies and, and, and all of those. And then you start breaking down the numbers and when we parcel out, the, let's say, comparing now the Korean numbers, which are big, with the Greek numbers, which are also big, leaving behind the German, the Austrian, the Italian, and the Irish, which are not so big. So when, when two players, Greece and Korea, rise to the top as sending countries, as they are called, it then becomes interesting to, to kind of put them in proportion to one another. And of course, we go in with big numbers from Korea, and then we realize that Korea has four times the population of Greece. And the numbers of Koreans in that span from 48 to 62 is only about a thousand children higher than those of Greece. So Greece has 3,116 children coming in between 48 and 62. Korea has about a thousand more. But the Korean population is four times at lar as large. So that tells you that proportionally, Greece sent out an enormous number of people. If actually, if you propose if you scale it out, Greece sent at least twice the number of adoptees that Korea sent, even though the Greek children are never as visible as, as the Korean children. Now, mind you, after 62, Korea is rolling this out like a national industry, and then they really surpass everybody else. But until 1962, not only are the first mass adoptions, but also the largest mass adoption, dare I say, a Greek invention. And I don't think anybody realizes realizes that. And given the country at that moment has just about 7,000, uh, sorry, 7 million, uh, 7 and a half million in population, right? After we come out of the civil war, during the 40s, the population doesn't increase very much for all the known reasons. But as soon as we move out of the civil war, Greece has about 7,000, uh, uh, sorry, 7, mil, 7 and a half million people in population. That is a very small population. And it's a population that has already lost 28,000 of the children that were taken with the pedomasoma over the northern borders, another 10,000 that ended up in the pedopolis of Frederiki and where some people say even 14,000 and were thus kind of growing up in institutions for a, for a time at least separated from their families. So this country that has already severed families to the extent of 40,000 children cannot possibly be in a position to lose another 4,000 permanently. And with the emphasis on permanently. It, it, it's amazing. The, the, it's other part of, the other part of the image that had to do with this event was a, f a photo of a young of, of a young girl, and that young girl, of course, was was Mary Costa. Can you bring up her her book on uh, relating to to Dina? Because I, uh, if you can, Mary, talk a little bit about that picture. I mean, it it, it evoked a lot of different things with those eyes. I, I have to be honest with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about about that girl, and also uh, after that, tell us a little bit about ripped at the root and, and adoption story. Um, that photo uh, was actually taken when I was a um, getting uh, being naturalized as a U.S. citizen, and I was three years old, and um, I they told me not to smile, and uh, and so I did I was obedient and I did not, 
My father, that photo is um, my father's favorite photo of me. And I, he had that photo in his wallet his whole life. And when he died, I, I, I wanted his wallet and I had to peel that photo out of the wallet. Um, and I, when I look at that photo, I mean, I, I mean, I can relate. When I look at that photo, I can relate to orphans. I can relate to refugees. I can relate to children all over the world who are kind of in distress. And that photo was taken at a time when I was absolutely terrified to be without my parents. Uh, I needed to be with my, my parents. Um, and, and I honestly couldn't sleep away from them I, or my grandparents. My, my grandparents were sort of like my second par set of parents because they were the ones who chose me. They picked me. And so they really felt some ownership to, you know, raising me and all of that. But uh, e even when I look at that photo, it evokes a lot of a lot of uh, feelings in me when I look at that photo. So that's the history of the photo, and um, it's swirling around social media now. So uh, <laughs> any anyway, and I and I hope it, you know, I hope it advances the movement. I hope people use it. It advances the movement in some way because. That was the moment I kind of lost my, my line to, to being a Greek because now I was going to become American citizen and that was lost to me. So maybe that photo too means kind of loss as well. Um, and maybe that's why I look kind of melancholy, I guess. Um, Cer certainly, you were a positive addition to, you know, the United States of America, and, and certainly, you. obviously, to Greece. Can you tell us a little bit about Dina, just a little? Oh, Dina, Dina, Dina is an amazing, amazing woman. She is uh, absolutely courageous. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you too much about the book because of that the journey of that book. When people read it, people at every kind of chapter, it's a short story really, but people with every turn are sort of amazed at what happens to her. I can tell you this, she, she was, you know, she, she was trying to get back to Greece for the death of a relative um, and, and the relative died uh, and she, she had to get back to Athens. And she had the worst time trying to get back here because she didn't have documents. She doesn't have proper documents. And so they were running around at a time when they needed to get here for a funeral to prove who this woman was and that she had a tie to the person who died. Um, and so she, not only was she mourning the death of this person, but she was frantic trying to prove that she was Dina Pulius related to the person who had died in Greece. Um, this book pulls no punches. Um, there are no names that have been changed. Uh, the, the, the people, all the people's names are there. Um, the places are real. Everything's real about the story. There's no and I thought that her coming forward finally to tell the truth uh, about hap what happened to her is um, amazing, amazing. And she suffered. She suffered for a long time. And I hope that this brings her some peace. Very good. Thank you so much. Vasilya, let me, let me ask you a question. Are, are you still the ombudsman for the region of Attica? No, no, no. Um, I, I, I've quit it in the 2019. Okay. Uh, a, a, a lot of the things that you have worked on, obviously, is uh, as a mediator, you know, uh, without having to go to court and all the rest of that. You've brought up this, uh, in my opinion, a very interesting approach uh, and uh, an appropriate approach for handling this issue for, for a lot of people uh, who have serious problems trying to find not only information, but after they find the information to go through the process. What do you suggest and what do you recommend uh, that, that we 
and also, uh, you know, just around this particular issue that can be done within the Hellenic Republic to start the concept of legislation, putting together legislation, and then selling it politically so the politicians can actually vote on this particular thing? Great question. Yes, uh, of course, uh, it should be a result of a great discussion among us uh, because we have to deliberate uh, very carefully and to, uh, to, to provide the government uh, um, a sound uh, solution in terms of um, drafting legislation or, or perhaps taking other measures because um, there are also some, some measures to be taken um, like um, uh, administrative ones uh, in order to, to find out data from the records when you are entitled to do so. Uh, legislation is not uh, always the key to, to access to documents. Uh, of course, we, we don't have also in Greece a Freedom of Information Act, a FOIA, which is also a problem. Uh, but we have some uh, provisions that uh, allow the public to have uh, access and we must uh, start, must op uh, absolutely uh, put uh, uh, in force the GDPR uh, uh, provisions in order for the uh, data subjects to have uh, access. Uh, so I think that we, we must discuss and we, mu we must approach the uh, the Prime Minister's office. Um, this is a, an open office. The, um, the idea is uh, to be uh, to act like a, a kind of head of state, a kind of a president, even though the Hellenic, the Greek system uh, is, a, uh, is based on the idea of uh, the parliamentary democracy. Uh, Mr. Mitsotakis, uh, um, as a uh, as as a, um, a student of the Harvard University, it has also um, the idea of how the president uh, uh, reacts. And um, yeah, a lot of Harvard people. We need some Harvard lawyers to put together the legislation, the draft <laughs> legislation. So uh, I think that um, uh, if if we contact uh, the prime ministers, the prime minister's office, um, we might have. Uh, um, a good, uh, a first uh, good uh, point in order to um, to shed light on the on the on the whole, on this whole uh, discussion. Well, we, we we certainly need. I'm sorry, Mary. Go ahead. Oh, I had an, a, a, a a question for Vasily. Vasily, what what do you recommend that the adoptees do? What can we do for ourselves to to help you do what you, what you are doing for us? Yeah. Um, and, and what Honda has been trying to do for, for years now, what, what do we need to do? First of all, I, I am about to send you an email in order to send me uh, the final decision that uh, you were, uh, uh, that you had your citizenship uh, restored. Because ah. this, is, this is also a very important document as a precedent. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, but, okay. uh, but, to the, but to the audience, uh, to the audience out there, whether they're uh, American or Hellenic, uh, me, me, meaning being in Greece and all the rest of that, I think, I think we need help. We need, we need uh, you know, uh, obviously people to go up to the prime minister's office and all the rest of that. You just can't go there with just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, some concept and some words. I, I, think, I think actually legislation should be drafted by, uh, by people that then they can approach someone and give them that as legislation that they would like to be approved. And uh, I, I strongly recommend that uh, some, some group be established in order to do that, to be representatives of that, to, to meet with the prime minister's office, to have that discussion, and then bring all the force of the media, the media, uh, you know, in Greece and in the United States and in these foreign countries where some of these, you know, uh, uh, adoptees uh, ended up. And, and, and this, has to be, this has to be pursued. Uh, yeah. We're heading towards the, the end. So what I'd like to do, if we can, uh, if you can, some final words, each one of you. And before we do the final words, I will say that we, we're, we're going to have another one of these sessions, obviously, in a few months. When some of these uh, books uh, will come out, obviously, 
but also so we can we can discuss uh, what's what's happened in the meanwhile. In other words, after a few months, we don't just want to have a topic. And then, you know, we did the topic, it's all great, this and that, and everybody, you know, forgot about it and it's going to the next topic. So this is not something that's going to be easy. It's going to take a while. It has to constantly be out there and it has to be, um, let's say, coordinated and at the same time, step by step, adding and adding to it as, as we go along and just talking to each other to find out what's been happening in between these different panel discussions uh, we may have. So if you'd like to start, Gwanda, some, some concluding remarks, at least for this session. Yes, I would definitely like to invite the AHEPA to join in this effort, given that they have the longest history with this, uh, the longest connection with this adoption movement. I think it would be very right and it would inspire the current AHEPA with a cause that is worthy and that corrects something of its history with the weight they have and the presence they've made, especially recently in Greece. I think it would be a, a cause worthwhile for the AHEPA under to undertake, and it would be very much welcomed by the adoptees. And they can Thank throw you, a lot a lot of their weight in with the, with the demand as it goes forward. Thank, thank you, Vonda, for that. Uh, Mary? Um, I just want to, and this, this isn't necessarily a plug for books, but I do, I do want to encourage our audience to educate them, especially the diaspora, to educate yourself about this issue. Uh, Gan Honda's book is is um, is really wonderful and really dives deep into what happened, and Greeks need to understand what happened. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, if you read if you read Ripped at the Root, it, it's it's just it's an example of what happened, a real life story from beginning to end of what happened to this one woman. And, and it happened to many, many, many adoptees. And so I'm encouraging people to read about adoption and even read about uh, this book called American Baby because it's really the same thing happened in American Baby to an American couple that di then did in, uh, that did in Ripped at the Root to Dina Pulius. So, and I would also encourage your audience, Lou, to talk to adoptees. Um, because they'll tell you how they feel uh, and they feel deeply about what happened to them. Um, so those are my final words. Mary, thank you so much. And obviously, like, like I said, we will have another session and maybe we can bring some of those adoptees uh, be, besides uh, yourself, obviously, mm -hmm. to, to have that, that dialogue. Uh, Vasily, some concluding remarks? Yes, all this uh, discussion includes involves um, uh, lots of reading. There is a there are important uh, pieces of uh, literature, bibliography, and I think that um, your idea to create uh, a kind of a task force in order to bring all the powers together and uh, try to lobby with the Greek government in order to, to find out uh, what the best. Uh, um, administrational and uh, legislational solution will be uh, is the best one and uh, I, my feeling is that uh, it's um, a history in the making it's people's mm -hmm. history also it has to do with what the state did but it has to do with the the, in, the intervention of the of the past and of the history and the, of the political history in um, in people's in in people the life in the very existence mm -hmm. of uh, and the faith of the people. Well, it, it's certainly it's certainly something that has to be addressed. Okay, it's gone on a long period of time. A lot of it has surfaced, certainly from uh, you know Gonda's book and Mary's book and some other some other you know adoptees who have started organizations. All the rest of that and, and written uh, books and written and books and written. Others. Uh, and yeah. written books and, all, and yeah. all the rest of that. I'd, I'd like to really thank the panel for what I consider an extremely serious you know, discussion that we've had today. As I indicated from the beginning, it's the hope that, that this discussion is, uh, you know, continues. And we're, gonna, we're obviously gonna continue it here uh, at EMCA. We're not gonna let it go. You know, we've done, we, we do a lot of events as everyone knows but there are certain, certain things that are very important to us. And I think this is one of the, those very important things that, that we have to address as Hellenic people. 
uh, both in uh, in uh, the Hellenic Republic and also in the diaspora. It's, it's extremely, extremely important. Uh, to our audience, I'd like to th uh, thank you again for uh, being with us. For those who want to find out more about, uh, you know, some of our programs that will be coming up, you can go on the internet at embca.com and certainly go on YouTube uh, under uh, EMBCA, on YouTube under EMBCA, uh, to get a lot of the programs that we have. We have a whole series of, of you know, of dialogues on, on all types of very, very interesting issues. For those who can subscribe to, uh, to EMCA on YouTube, there is no cost. And as you know, there is no cost for the panel discussions that we have. We have no membership because we don't, we don't care about membership. Uh, all we care about is that we get information out there that's important uh, to us uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And certainly this is one of those more, more important uh, aspects that we should discuss. In the next couple of weeks, uh, I'm trying to put together an event around the, uh, the construction of St. Nicholas, a Greek Orthodox Church and National Shrine in Lower Manhattan. I'm trying to round up the appropriate engineers who are involved in the, in the project, as well as some of the contractors to go through some of those things that people never really talk about. We talk about architecture, we talk about theology, but we never talk about those people who actually make something happen in terms of a, a physical work, a, a building. We are going to have a, a live event uh, in, uh, in Manhattan for Ochi Day. And in terms um, of, uh, I'm sorry? We, we are going to have a live event for Ochi Day on October uh, 28th at the Three West Club. And that, again, is going to be open to the, to the public. Um, it'll be great to see everyone again live in, 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 in a venue. Obviously, you'll have to have your vaccination cards and all, and all the rest of that. But things like, things like also uh, national holidays that sometimes... I hate to say this, even the, even the government officials, the Hellenic government officials don't have some of the things that we want to do and not forget. You know, we don't forget who we are. As the adoptees have indicated, they haven't forgotten who they are. We in the diaspora have not forgotten who we are. All we're asking for, quite frankly, is to be recognized to who we are, okay, to who we are, which sometimes, unfortunately, uh, we're not. So with that, I leave you. And, and thank you again to the panelists uh, for a great, great discussion. Uh, we will come back to this issue again in a few months. Thank you all. Thank you for thank being you. with us. Thank you. Thank you. This was delightful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.